chapter eight of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter eight my frolic falcon with bright eyes everybody in trelasco and in the neighbourhood seemed glad to see colonel disney again all the best people within a six-mile drive came bearing down upon the angler's nest in the week that followed his return and there were cosy little afternoon tea drinkings in the drawing-room or on the lawn and isla had her hands full in receiving visitors everybody congratulated her upon having her hero back from the wars you ought to be very proud of your husband mrs disney said van sittart crowther with his air of taking all the world under his protection i have always been proud of him isla answered gently i was proud of him before the burmese war your poor wife has been looking very unhappy for the last few months mrs crowther said to the colonel with a motherly glance at isola i really had a good mind to write to you and beg you to hurry home if you didn't want to find the poor thing far gone in a decline when you came back my dear mrs crowther what nonsense cried isola growing crimson at this motherly officiousness i have never been out of health or in the least likely to go into a decline one cannot always look like a dairy-maid my dear there's no use talking you look very bad had one of my girls looked as ill i should have taken her off to buxton to drink the waters without an hour's delay that visit of the crowthers seemed much longer than any other afternoon call the crowthers husband and wife and elder daughter had an inquisitorial air isola fancied an air of scrutinizing her house and herself and her surroundings which was intolerable to her although on mrs crowther's part she knew the scrutiny was made in the utmost benevolence and the officiousness was the outcome of a nature overflowing with the milk of human kindness i wish you had written to me mrs crowther said disney i couldn't have come home any sooner but i could have telegraphed to my sister allegra to look after my wife and cheer her solitude i was a fool not to have had her here all along hadn't i better go out of the room while you are holding your consultation about me exclaimed isola fretfully it's rather hard upon the patient to hear her case discussed in cold blood i am tired of declaring that i have not been ill and that it is my misfortune and not my fault to have a pale complexion you were not always so pallid my dear said mrs crowther persistently you were one of the beauties of the hunt ball and you had colour enough that night dr and mrs bainham came the following afternoon and these two told the same story though with less obtrusive concern i looked after the young lady now and then said the worthy doctor and as i found there was nothing radically wrong i didn't worry you with any low-spirited reports but i expect to see her pick up wonderfully now you have come home she didn't take enough outdoor exercise that's where the harm was she used to be so fond of her boat last year but this year i fancy she didn't feel herself up to handling the skulls you didn't now did you mrs disney i don't know about that but i am ready to row to the land's end now martin is back said isola and those few words seemed the sweetest martin disney had heard since colonel manwaring's daughter promised to be his wife mrs bainham sat on the lawn sipping her tea and basking in the afternoon sunshine you should have seen your wife in her wedding-gown at the lost with your dance she said you would have been proud of her she didn't want to go refused mrs crowther and me again and again she thought it wasn't right to be at any merry-making while your life was in danger yes i know i know my tender-hearted isola 
but at last we got the better of her objections and though there were a good many pretty women there and though miss crowther perhaps pleased most tastes being a more showy style of beauty to my thinking there wasn't one came up to mrs disney her partners seemed of the same opinion put in the doctor cheerily why how often did lord lostwithiel dance with you mrs disney oftener than with anybody else i'll be bound mrs bainham nodded approvingly i was very proud of my party that evening i can tell you colonel disney she said it isn't often that one has to chaperone three attractive young women do you know that my youngest niece maria has had two offers since that night isola and when i last heard from her she was on the brink of an engagement ah well i hope we shall have another ball next december now that the neighbourhood has begun to wake up a bit we have been thinking of getting up a water picnic this summer just a little excursion to mavagasy and a little fishing for those who might care for it very pleasant indeed of you answered the colonel cheerily we will be there the crowthers are rather grand in their ideas said the doctor but alicia is very keen upon all kind of sport so i know she'll want to come whatever belinda may say to it mrs bainham made a wry face at the name of the elder sister it was an involuntary and unconscious contortion but belinda had tried to snub mrs bainham who never could forget that her father was a banker at truro and held the fortunes the mortgages and encumbrances of the landed gentry in the hollow of his hand you don't like the elder miss crowther speculated the colonel well if i am to be candid i must confess that i have a positive aversion to that young lady the airs she gives herself on the strength of her father's wool are really insupportable and since lord lostwithiel disappointed her she has been more odious than she was before what do you mean by lostwithiel disappointing her did he jilt her well it could scarcely be called jilting and i really don't know that there was anything between them but people had coupled their names and he dined at glenaveril at least once a week all the time he was at the mount and people had quite made up their minds it was to be a match mr crowther went about talking of lord lostwithiel and his affairs as if he was his father-in-law the neglected condition of the land and what ought to be done at the mount and that the estate wanted judicious nursing and all that sort of thing and then one december morning his lordship sailed off in his yacht before it was light and there was no more heard of him it was quite in his way to go off suddenly like that but the crowthers were evidently taken by surprise and we heard no more about lord lostwithiel and the mount they dropped him like a hot potato said the doctor well we shall depend upon you both for our water party it will not be till the middle of july when an old chum of mine a sailor will be coming this way this was a sample of many such visits in the country and even in london upon occasion people are given to discussing the same subjects martin disney heard a good deal about the crowthers and their supposed disappointment people liked mrs crowther for her simple unaffected ways and thorough-going kindliness but visitart and his daughters had made a good many enemies he was too coarse they were too fine only the mother's simple nature had caught the golden mean between blunt vulgarity and artificial smartness colonel disney heard all this village gossip with an unheeding ear he was secure in his own position as a son of the soil a man whose pedigree could pass muster with that of the bashleys and the treffries a man of means that were ample for his own unpretending tastes and requirements he cared not a jot how many guineas a year the crowthers might give to their cook or how much mr crowther had paid for the furnishing and decoration of his house a theme upon which the gossips of the neighbourhood loved to enlarge that mrs crowther had gowns from worth and that her daughters employed mrs mason irked not the simple soldier the only point in all the stream of talk that had affected him was the unanimous opinion that trelasco in the spring had been too relaxing for mrs disney 
or else that her solitude had preyed upon her mind inasmuch as she had looked so ill as to afford an interesting subject of conversation to a good many friendly people who suffered from the chronic malady of not having enough to talk about a form of starvation almost as bad as not having enough to eat the colonel listened and made his own conclusions he did not believe that trelasco was relaxing he loved the district too well to believe any evil thing about it those fresh breezes that blew up from the sea those balmy airs that breathed across the heather-clad hills must bring health with them what could one have better than that mingling of sea and hill brine and honey gorse-bloom and seaweed no trelasco was not to blame his young wife had suffered for lack of youthful company he made up his mind accordingly i suppose you won't object to our having allegra here for a summer visit will you love he asked at breakfast the day after mrs bainham's call london must be hot and dusty and dreary in july and she must want rest and country air i fancy after having worked so hard in her art school isola gave a scarcely perceptible sigh as she bent to caress tim a privileged attendant of the breakfast-table object of course not martin i shall be very pleased for your sister to come here i feel very sure you will be pleased with her when you and she get upon intimate terms you could know so little of her from that one evening in the cavendish road the occasion in question was an evening in which isola and her husband had been bidden to a friendly dinner on their way through london by the clergyman's widow with whom allegra lived while she pursued her study of art at a famous school in st john's wood the clergyman's widow mrs meynell was a distant cousin of the disneys and allegra's home had been with her from the time she left school the extent of her wanderings after she was old enough to be sent to a boarding-school had been from falmouth to kensington and from kensington to st john's wood with occasional holidays in the isle of thanet i thought she was very fresh and bright and loving answered isola and i could see even in that one evening that she was very fond of you yes god bless her there is no doubt about that i have been brother and father too for her she has had no one but me since our mother's death shall i write and ask her to come to us martin or will you i fancy she would take it more as a compliment if the invitation went straight from you she would know that i would be glad to have her but she might feel a little doubtful about you then i'll write to her to-day martin and beg her to come at once as soon as ever she can pack her boxes that's my darling i hope she won't bore you when she is here i have a shrewd idea she'll make your life happier she'll awaken you from that languor which has grown upon you in your loneliness at least i'll try to make her happy martin if it is only for your sake ah and you will soon love her for her own sake i'll get the boat looked to at once and i'll see about making the spare-room pretty for her said isola a week later allegra was with them breakfasting on the lawn in the balmy atmosphere of july there were two girls in white gowns under the tulip tree instead of one and martin disney felt as if his domestic happiness were doubled as he looked at those two graceful figures in the flickering light below that canopy of broad bright leaves another element of comfort too had entered the angler's nest for the incompetent cook had taken her incompetency and a month's wages to her native city of truro and a buxom damsel from falmouth recommended by tabitha had already proved herself a treasure in the culinary art never was there a fairer picture than that domestic group under the tulip tree the two girlish figures in white muslin with palest salmon and palest azure ribbons fluttering and glancing in the light and deepening in the shadow the white fox terrier alert muscular mercurial the tortoise-shell cat long-haired aristocratic and demure 
the pretty moorish plateau on bamboo legs the purple and crimson breakfast service and rare old silver urn the fruit and flowers and amber-hued butter and rustic luxury of preserved fruit and clotted cream how lovely it all is after cavendish road cried allegra rapturously when i see the lights and shadows upon those hills i despair of ever being able to paint a landscape as long as i live nature is maddeningly beautiful what is your particular line allegra asked her brother is it landscape no i only care for landscape as a background for humanity i want to paint genre pictures in water-colour women and children beautiful women amidst beautiful surroundings picturesque poverty interesting bits of daily life mrs allingham is the ideal after which i strive but i am only at the bottom of the ladder it is a long climb to the top but one does not mind that in a profession where labour is delight you are fond of art then said isola watching the earnest face of the speaker fond of it why i live for it the dream of my life from the time i was seven years old has been one long dream of the bliss that was to be mine when i could feel myself able to paint i have toiled with all my might martin disliked the idea of my being an academy student poor foolish ignorant martin so i have been obliged to plod on at st john's wood without hope of prizes or medals but on the whole i have been very lucky for i have made friends among the academicians they are very kind to any student who seems in right down earnest and they have been ever so good to me i hope martin you will find some day that i am something better than an amateur she concluded resting her two hands caressingly upon her brother's shoulder my dearest i have not the least doubt you will astonish me i am very ignorant of everything connected with art i set my face against the academy because i thought the training and the life would be too public for my sister as if burlington house were any more public than that big school at st john's wood my dear illogical brother and yet we women are the only people who are said to be wanting in the logical faculty she leant back in her basket chair revelling in the rural atmosphere and in that new sense of being in the bosom of her family tim leaped upon her lap and licked her face in token of his acceptance of her into the home circle nobody had ever called miss leland a beauty nor had she ever received those disquieting attentions which follow the footsteps of exceptional loveliness she was sometimes described as a girl who grew upon one and people who knew her well generally ended by thinking her distractingly pretty she had a brilliant complexion of the true english type fair and blooming a complexion which indicated perfect health and an active orderly life no late hours or novel reading over the fire an out-of-door complexion which would have looked its best under a neat little felt hat in the hunting field or under a coquettish straw sailor hat on board a yacht her eyes were blue-gray with long brown lashes and boldly marked eyebrows her nose was firmly modelled inclining a little to the aquiline order her mouth was the prettiest feature in her face and yet it was a shade larger than accepted perfection in mouths it was a mouth chiefly remarkable for character and expression and indeed it was the individuality and variety of expression in the fair young face which constituted miss leland's chief claim to distinction she started up from the nest of basket-work and flowered chintz and stood tall and erect a juno-like young woman with heavy plaits of reddish-brown hair rolled in a great knot at the back of her head she might have answered one of those harsh advertisements for parlour-maids in which the words no fringe figure with curt cruelty for her hair was brushed smoothly back from the fair forehead and the severity of the style became that wide sagacious brow it was just the kind of forehead which can endure exposure without conveying an idea of bald ugliness 
she was tall and strongly made fashioned after the semblance of diana or atalanta rather than venus or psyche her every movement had the bold free grace of vigorous unspoiled youth she had always been active fond of walking riding rowing swimming as well as of art and with an ardent passion for the country which had made existence in a london suburb one long sacrifice i used to take the train for hampstead heath or willesden she told her brother and go off for long lonely tramps to finchley or hendon i have watched the builders progress along roads and lanes i loved i have seen horrid brick boxes creeping along like some new kind of noxious insect eating up fields and hedgerows old hawthorns and old hollies i could have sat down in the muddy road and cried sometimes at the thought that soon there would be no country walk left within reach of a londoner once i went off to the northeast to look for the rural lanes charles lamb and his sister loved the lanes and meadows where they carried their little picnic basket till they took shelter at a homely inn oh martin all those fields and lanes charles lamb's country are going going or gone it is heart-breaking and they are building at fowry too i see positively there will be no country anywhere soon there will be crescents and terraces and little ugly streets at the very land's end and the logan rock will be the sign of a public house don't be downhearted chatterbox i think cornwall may last our time said disney laughing at her vehemence allegra was a great talker it seemed as if she had a wellspring of joy and life within her which must find an outlet when people ventured to hint at her loquacity she declared that her name was in fault i have grown up to match my name she said if i had been christened penserosa i might have been quite a different person her vivacity gave a new element of brightness to the angler's rest where disney had been somewhat oppressed by the sensation of intense repose which had pervaded his tete-a-tete life with isola he loved his wife so entirely so unselfishly and devotedly that it was happiness to him to be with her yet in the three or four weeks that had gone by since his return he had struggled in vain against the feeling that there was something wanting in his home isla waited upon him and deferred to him with more than wifely submissiveness he would have liked a spurt of rebellion once in a way a little burst of girlish temper just to show that she was human but none ever came his every desire was anticipated whatever plan he suggested to walk to drive to visit or not to visit the river or the sea was always the plan that pleased her best or at least she said so i think i shall call you griselda instead of isola he said one day taking the fair pale face between his hands and gazing into the mournful depths of the dark violet eyes inscrutable eyes they seemed to him when the pupils dilated under his gaze as if the eyes made a darkness to hide their meaning why she asked a flood of crimson passed over her face like a fire and left her paler than before because you are only too dutiful would you resist if i were to turn tyrant i wonder i have no fear of your turning tyrant she answered with a sad little smile you are only too good to me good there can be no question of goodness if a man picked up a diamond as precious as the koh nur could he be good to it how can i be good to my gem i have but one thing left in the world to desire or to pray for what is that martin to see you happy again the sudden flame crimsoned her face that sensitive spiritual face which reflected every change of feeling i am happy martin quite happy happier than i ever thought to be now that you are home again what have i more to desire is that really so was my long absence your greatest trouble 
yes she answered slowly looking at him with a curiously steady look that was the beginning and end of my trouble thank god he said drawing a deep breath there have been moments just of late when i have puzzled my brains about you until i thought very slowly there might have been something else he clasped her in his arms and hid her face upon his breast as if fearing that he might have wounded her by those last words he wanted to make amends before she had time to feel his unkindness his tenderness for her had so much of that pitying love which a strong man feels for a child this conversation occurred the day before allegra's arrival but with that young lady's appearance on the scene new life and gladness came into the little household allegra sang allegra played allegra ran out into the garden twenty times a day and called through the open window to isola sitting quietly in the drawing-room to come out and look at this or that a rose finer than all other roses a suggested alteration an atmospheric effect anything and everything she was a keen observer of nature full of vivid interest in every creature that lived and in every flower that grew tim followed her everywhere as she danced along the gravel walks or across the short springy turf tim adored her and grinned at her and threw himself into all manner of wriggling attitudes upon the grass to express his delight in her company and fawned at her feet and talked to her after his guttural fashion snorting his friendly feelings tim had long languished for such a companion having found his young mistress's society very heavy of late no more runs in the meadow no more rambles in the neighbouring spinney and very little boating but now that allegra had come the skiff was seldom idle isla had to go on the river whether she liked or not there were strong young arms ready to pull her round young arms of a lovely roseate fairness which looked their best stretched to the motion of the skulls with the white cambric shirt rolled up above the elbow you can read shelley while i scull the boat said allegra i don't want any help if you knew what rapture it is to me to feel the breath of sea gods and tritons after st john's wood and the smoke from the metropolitan railway you wouldn't pity me isola submitted and sat at her ease upon bright-coloured cushions with an indian rug spread round her as idle as if she had been the belle of a zanana and read alister while the boat sped seaward in the sunshine sometimes they moored their boat at the landing stage at pool rouen and walked up the hill to the point and sat there for an hour or two in the summer wind with their books and picnic basket seeing great ships go out towards the lizard and the big distant world or sail merrily homeward towards plymouth and the start isola looked at those outward bound ships with a strange longing in her eyes a longing to flee away upon those broad wings that flashed whitely in the sunlit distance were people happy on board those ships she wondered happy at escaping from the fetters of an old life and a beaten path happy going away to strange lands and freedom she had been reading many books of travel of late and a kind of passion for remote uncivilized countries had come upon her as if that untrammelled life meant release from memory and saddening cares a new birth almost it seemed from some of those books as if there could be no greater happiness upon this earth than to tramp across sandy deserts and stalk occasional lions while in others the supreme good seemed to be found in the attempt to scale impossible mountains what was it that made the rapture of these things isla wondered was it that perils and wild solitudes offered the only possible escape out of a past existence on this side of the grave allegra had never so much as crossed the channel she had been 
brought up in the most humdrum fashion first a school at falmouth and then a smarter school at kensington and then st john's wood and the art school her mother had died when she was fourteen years of age and since that time her brother had been her only guardian and almost her only friend her life had seen but little variety and very little of the dancing and gaiety which for most girls is the only form of pleasure she and isola talked about the ships as they sat upon the grassy hill at Rouen and speculated about the lands of which they knew only what they had read in books of travel you at least know what france is like said allegra and that is something only one little corner of france and to think that you were born in an old french city it seems strange do you feel at all french i don't think so only sometimes a longing comes upon me to see the old grey walls and to hear the old voices and see the curious old women in their white caps and bright coloured handkerchiefs clattering along to the cathedral there must be more old women in brittany than in cornwall i think fowry does not swarm with old women as dinant did and sometimes i long to see mother and the good old brittany servants and the garden where the hours went by so slowly almost as slowly as they go here with a sigh does time go so very slowly here asked allegra quickly that sounds as if you were unhappy what nonsense you talk cried isola with a flash of sudden anger cannot one be dull and bored sometimes from very idleness without being unhappy i don't know but for my own part when i am happy i am never dull you have more of what people call animal spirits than i have i'm glad you apologize in a manner for that odious phrase animal spirits i would not apply such a phrase to tim it suggests nothing but audrey at a statue fair heaven gave me a capacity for happiness and i thank god every night in my prayers for another happy day even at school i contrive to be happy somehow and think what it must be after seven years of dull routine to feel that i have done with sitting at a stranger's table and that i am here in a home my own home with my brother and sister the two women clasped hands and kissed each other upon this only the night before isola of her own free will had asked her sister-in-law to make her home at the angler's nest always always till she should be let out of it as a bride and martin had shown himself supremely happy in the knowledge that his sister had won his wife's love and confidence when isola and he were alone together after the sealing of that family bond he kissed and thanked her for this boon which she had bestowed upon him i never could have felt quite at ease while allegra was living with strangers he told her and now my cup is full but are you sure dearest that you will never find her in the way never fancy yourself any the less mistress of your house and of my life because she is here never 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 i am gladder than i can say to have her she is a delightful companion she helps me in a hundred ways but even if she were less charming it would be my duty to have her here since you like her to be with us it must not be done as a duty i will not have you sacrifice your inclination in the slightest degree what an obtuse person you are don't i tell you that i am enchanted to have her she is as much my sister as ever gwendolen was indeed she is much more sympathetic than gwen ever was then i am perfectly content allegra wrote to mrs meynell next day announcing the decision that had been arrived at not without grateful acknowledgments of that lady's kindness the rest of her belongings were to be sent to her forthwith easels and colour boxes books and knick-knacks her brother's gifts most of them from the romantic east things which made her few little kensingtonian keepsakes look very trivial and philistine 
allegra's possessions gave a new individuality to the large airy bedroom and the tiny boudoir at the corner of the house looking seaward which isola had arranged for her while these things were doing martin disney was buying horses and buying land a farm of over two hundred acres which would make his property better worth holding and he had further employed a plymouth architect to plan an enlargement of the old-fashioned cottage a new and much more spacious drawing-room two bedrooms over a veranda below and a loggia above in that mild climate the loggia would afford a pleasant lounge even in winter and myrtle and roses would speedily cover the wooden columns which sustained the tiled roof it was to be a homely italian loggia unpretentious and not particularly architectural but isola and her sister-in-law were delighted at the idea the stables were to be enlarged as well as the house you have no idea how i have hoarded and scraped to lay by money ever since i bought the nest said disney i believe i was the greatest screw in the service all through my last campaign he laughed aloud in amused remembrance of many small sacrifices while the three heads clustered over the architect's plan which had that factitious prettiness of delicate drawing and colour which makes every house so much nearer perfection upon paper than it ever can be in brick and stone End of chapter eight chapter nine of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter nine lies nothing buried long ago like most small country settlements little fraternities of well-to-do people who think themselves the beginning and end of the world trelasco was slow to rise to any festivity in the way of party giving so it was about two months after colonel disney's return before the friendly calls and interchange of small civilities culminated in a dinner-party at glenaveril it seemed indeed only right and natural that the great house of the district great by reason of lord lostwithiel's non-residence should be the first to open its doors in a ceremonial manner to the colonel and his womankind the invitation to his sister might be taken as an especial compliment arms outstretched to receive one who was a stranger in the land we want to know that nice young sister of yours mr crowther said to colonel disney in his patronizing way as they all came out of church the sunday before the dinner-party a remarkably fine girl the colonel did not thank him for this compliment which was pronounced in a loud voice amidst the little knot of acquaintances taking leave of each other on the dip of the hill where there was a signpost on a patch of waste grass and where road and lanes divided one up the hill to tyward wreath another to fowry and a narrow wooded lane leading down to glenaveril and the angler's nest short as the distance was there were carriages waiting for the crowthers who never walked to church however fine the weather mrs crowther came to the morning service resplendent in a brocade gown and a parisian bonnet on pain of being condemned as dowdy by her husband who liked to put the stamp of his wealth upon every detail his wife obeyed him with wifely meekness but the daughters were not so easily ruled both were keen-witted enough to feel the vulgarity of sunday morning splendour so belinda worshipped in the exaggerated simplicity of an unstarched jaconet muslim 
a yellow liberty sash a flopping gainsborough hat and a necklace of indian beads an attire which attracted every eye and was a source of wonder to the whole congregation while alicia's neat grey cashmere frock and smart little toque to match grey gloves grey prayer-book and sunshade challenged criticism as a study in monochrome mr crowther would have lingered for further conversation before getting into the family landau but colonel disney bade a rather abrupt good morning to the whole group and hurried his wife and sister down the hill i'm rather sorry we accepted the glenaveril invitation he said to isola the man is such an unmitigated cad mrs crowther is very kind and good replied his wife but i have never cared much about going to glenaveril i don't feel that i get on particularly well with the girls they are both too fine for me but i should be sorry to offend mrs crowther yes she seems a kindly creature it was thoughtful of her sending you a ticket for the ball a woman with daughters is seldom over kind to outsiders oh i believe mrs crowther's heart is big enough to be kind to a whole parish well on her account perhaps it was best to accept the invitation don't be so grand about it martin said allegra you forget that i am pining to see what a dinner-party in a very rich house is like i have seen nothing in london but literary and artistic dinners third-rate literary and third-rate artistic i'm afraid but they were very nice all the same glenaveril is a place that takes my breath away and i am curious to see what a dinner-party can be like there then for your sake allegra i'm glad we said yes only i couldn't stand that fellow patronizing you calling you a fine girl forsooth yes it is an odious phrase is it not i'm afraid i shall have to live through it because like rosalind i am more than common tall she drew herself up to her full height straight as a reed but with fully developed bust and shoulders which showed to advantage in her pale to sorry gown silk that her brother had sent her from india she looked the incarnation of girlish innocence and girlish happiness a brow without a cloud a step light as a fawn's a fearless joyous nature her more commonplace features and finer figure were in curious contrast with isola's pensive beauty and too fragile form disney glanced from one to the other as he walked along the rustic lane between them and though he thought his wife the lovelier he regretted that she was not more like his sister a man who is very fond of home and who has no professional cares and occupations is apt to degenerate into a molly coddle martin disney gave an indication of this weakness on the day before the dinner at glenaveril what are you two girls going to wear he asked at least i don't think i need ask isola that question you'll wear your wedding gown of course love he added turning to his wife no martin i'm going to wear my grey silk grey a dowager's colour a soured spinster's colour a quaker's no colour i detest grey oh but this is a very pretty gown the palest shade of pearl colour and i wear pink roses with it it was made in paris i feel sure you will like me in it martin isola said hurriedly as if even this small matter fluttered her nerves not as well as i like you in your wedding gown that was made in paris and it fitted you like a glove i never saw such a pretty gown so simple yet so elegant i have been married much too long to dress as a bride you shall not seem as a bride except to me for my eyes only shall you shine in bridal loveliness bride or no bride what can be prettier for a young woman than a white satin gown with a long train you can wear some touch of colour to show you have not got yourself up as a bride what do you say allegra give us your opinion of course you are an authority upon dress oh the white satin by all means isola looks ethereal in white she ought hardly ever to wear anything else you hear isa 
two to one against you i'm sorry i can't be governed by your opinions in this instance you forget that i last wore my gown at a ball i danced a good deal the floor was dirty the gown was spoilt i shall never wear it again i hope that will satisfy you martin she spoke with a touch of temper her cheeks flushed crimson and her eyes filled with sudden tears as she looked deprecatingly at her husband martin disney felt himself a brute my dearest i didn't mean to tease you he said wear anything you like you are sure to be the prettiest woman in the room i am sorry the gown was spoiled but it can't be helped i'll buy you another white satin gown the first time you and i are in plymouth together and pray miss allegra what bravery will you sport i have only a white lace frock that has seen some service replied his sister meekly i dare say i shall look like somebody's poor relation at such a place as glenaveril oh it's not to be a grand party by any means mrs crowther told me she had asked the bainhams and the vicarage people to meet us just in a friendly way the party was decidedly small for on arriving with reasonable punctuality the disneys found only one guest on the scene in the person of mr colfox the curate who was sitting by one of the little tables showing a new puzzle of two pieces of interlinked iron to the two misses crowther these young ladies were so interested in the trick of disentanglement that they scarcely noticed the entrance of their mother's guests and only rose and came over to greet the party three minutes later as an afterthought mr and mrs crowther however were both upon the alert to receive their friends the lady frankly cordial the gentleman swelling with pompous friendliness as if his manly breast were trying to emerge from the moderate restriction of a very open waistcoat he protested that he was charmed to welcome colonel disney to glenaveril and he glanced round the splendid walls as who should say it is no light thing to invite people to such a house as this van sittart crowther was a man of short squat figure who tried to make up for the want of inches by extreme uprightness and had cultivated this carriage until he seemed incapable of bending he had a bald head disguised by one dappled streak of grey and sandy hair which was plastered into a curl on each side of his brow curls faintly suggestive of a cat's ears he had blunt features a sensual lip and dull fishy eyes large and protuberant with an expression in perfect harmony with the heavy sensual mouth mr and mrs bainham were the next arrivals the lady wearing the family amethysts and the well-known black velvet under whose weighty splendour she arrived short of breath the gentleman expansive of shirt front and genial of aspect jovial at the prospect of a good dinner and choice wines and not hypercritical as to the company in which he ate the feast he shook hands with his host and hostess and then went over to the misses crowthers who had not thought it necessary to suspend their absorbing occupation in order to welcome the village doctor's wife a fact which mrs bainham observed and inwardly resented mr colfox deserted the young lady still puzzling over the two bits of iron and went across the room to greet the disneys he was an intelligent young man steeped to the lips in the opinions and the prejudices of university life oxford life that is to say he ranked as a literary man in trelasco on the strength of having had an article almost published in blackwood the editor had accepted my paper he told people modestly but on further consideration he found it was a little too long and so in point of fact he sent it back to me in the most courteous manner he couldn't have acted more kindly but i was disappointed it would have been such an opening you see 
all mr colfox's friends agreed that with such an opening the high road to literary fame and fortune would have been made smooth for his feet they respected him even for this disappointment to have been accepted by blackwood made him almost a colleague of george eliot he was a tall and rather lean young man who wore an eyeglass and seemed to live upon books it was irritating to vansittart crowther who prided himself on his cellar and his cook to note how little impression food and drink made upon francis colfox he takes my chateau equem as if it were devonshire cider said the aggrieved parvenu and he hardly seems to know that this is the only house where he ever sees clear turtle the man's people must have lived in a very poor way in spite of this contemptuous opinion mr crowther was always polite to francis colfox and had even thought of him as a pis aller for one of his daughters there is hardly anything in this life which a self-made man respects so much as race and francis colfox belonged to an old county family had a cousin who was an earl and another cousin who was talked of as a probable bishop he was therefore allowed to make himself very much at home at glenaveril and to speak his mind in a somewhat audacious way to the whole family captain pentreath an army man of uncertain age a bachelor and one of a territorial family of many brothers came next and then appeared the vicar and his wife and one daughter who made up the party the vicar was deaf but amiable and beamed benevolently upon a world about whose spoken opinions he knew so little that he might naturally have taken it for a much better world than it is the vicar's wife spent her existence in interpreting and explaining people's speech to the vicar and had no time to spare for opinions of her own the daughter was characterized by a gentle nullity tempered by a somewhat enthusiastic and evangelical piety the chief desire of her life was to keep the church as it had been in the days of her childhood nearly thirty years before it was the first time the disneys had dined together at glenaveril so it seemed only proper that mr crowther should give his arm to isola which he did with an air of conferring an honour the colonel had been ordered to take the vicar's wife and the doctor was given to allegra captain pentreath took miss trequite the vicar's daughter mr colfox followed with mrs baynham and the daughters of the house went modestly to the dining-room after the vicar and mrs crowther the dinner-table was as pretty as roses and venetian glass could make it there was no pompous display of ponderous plate as there might have been thirty years ago on a parvenu's board everybody is enlightened nowadays the great culture movement has been as widespread among the middle class as compulsory education among the proletariat and everybody has a taste scarcely were they seated when mr crowther informed mrs disney that he hated a display of silver but at the same time took care to let her know that the venetian glass she admired was rather more valuable than that precious metal and if it's broken there's nothing left you for your outlay he said but it's a fancy of my wife and girls those decanters are better than anything salviati ever made for royalty the table was oval lighted by one large lamp under an umbrella-shaped amber shade a lamp which diffused a faint golden glow through the dusky room and through this dreamy dimness the footmen moved like ghosts while the table and the faces of the diners shone and sparkled in the brilliant light it was as picturesque a dining-room and table as one need care to see and if the gainsboroughs and reynoldses which here and there relieved the sombre russet of the cordovan leather hangings were not the portraits of mr and mrs crowther's ancestors they were not the less lovely or interesting as works of art isola sat by her host's side with a silent and somewhat embarrassed air which her husband noted as he watched her from the other side of the table 
all the decorations were low so that no pyramid of fruit or flowers intervened to prevent a man watching the face opposite to him disney saw that while allegra in her place between mr bainham and alicia crowther was full of talk and animation isla sat with downcast eyes and replied with a troubled look to her host's remarks there was something in that gentleman's manner which was particularly obnoxious to the colonel a protecting air a fatherly familiarity which brought the bald shining forehead almost in contact with isola's shoulder as the man bent to whisper and to titter in the very ear of his neighbour the colonel got through a little duty talk with mrs trequite whose attention was frequently distracted by the necessity of explaining mrs crowther's polite murmurs to the vicar on the other side of the table and this duty done he gave himself up to watching isola and her host why did she blush so when the man talked to her was it the bold admiration of those fishy eyes which annoyed her or the man's manner altogether or was it anything that he said disney strained his ears to hear their conversation if that could be called conversation which was for the most part monologue the man was talking of the hunt ball of last winter disney heard such snatches of speech as the prettiest woman in the room everybody said so lost with you was evidently a prix mr crowther had a penchant for scraps of french which decorated his speech as truffles adorn a boned turkey isn't it odd that he should be such a rover he asked in a less confidential tone than before isla looked up at him as if hardly understanding the question i mean lost with you with such a nice place as he has here it seems a pity to be broiling himself in peru i never could understand the taste for orchids and in his case well i hardly believe in it he is the last man to emulate a hooker or a lawrence orchid hunting must be an excuse for keeping away from england i take it don't you think so now mrs disney i really don't know you don't know why he should want to keep away no no more does anybody else only we all wonder don't you know he talked to me of settling down in the county looking after the estate a little he even hinted that he might in due course cast about for a nice young wife with a little money and then all of a sudden off he sails in that rakish yacht of his and rows from port to port like the flying dutchman in the opera till at last we hear of him, hear of him on the coast of peru curious ain't it mrs disney why curious asked isola coldly was not lord lostwithiel always fond of yachting no doubt but when a man talks of settling down in his native place and then doesn't do it there must be a reason mustn't there i don't know people act as often from caprice as from reason ah that is a lady's idea no man who is worthy the name ever acts from caprice said mr crowther with his insinuating air as if some hidden meaning were in the words and then looking across the table and seeing the colonel's watchful face he altered both tone and manner as he added of course you know lost with you colonel disney i saw a good deal of lord lost with you when he was a small boy answered the colonel coldly his father was one of my early friends but that is a long time ago how old is he do you say debrett will answer that question better than i can i have never reckoned the years that have gone by since i saw him in an eton collar the men did not sit long over their wine the doctor and his host talked agriculture mr crowther discussing all farming operations upon a large scale as became a man of territorial magnitude the vicar prosed about an approaching lecture at the schoolroom and utterly failed in hearing anything that was said in reply to his observations colonel disney smoked a cigarette in silence and with a moody brow 
later in the drawing-room while the crowther girls were playing a clamorous duet by the last fashionable sclavonic composer vansittart crowther directed his conversation almost wholly to mrs disney as if she were the only person worthy of his attention he was full of suggestions for future gaieties in which the disneys were to share picnics boating parties you must help us to wake up the neighbourhood colonel he said addressing disney with easy friendliness we are not very likely to be of much assistance to you in that line disney answered coldly we are quiet stay-at-home people my wife and i and take our pleasures on a very small scale colonel disney's carriage was announced at this moment he gave his wife a look which plainly indicated his wish to depart and she rose quickly from the low deep chair in which she had been sitting in some manner a captive while mr crowther lolled across the broad plush cushioned arm to talk to her allegra was engrossed in a talk about william morris's last poem with mr colfox who was delighted to converse with any one fresh from the far-away world of art and literature delighted altogether with allegra whose whole being presented a piquant contrast to the miss crowthers but the colonel's sister saw the movement towards departure and hastened to her brother's side briefest adieu followed and the first of the guests being gone left behind them a feeling of uneasiness in those whose carriages had been ordered half an hour later one premature departure will cast a blight upon your small dull party whereas from a scene of real mirth the nine muses and three graces might all slip away unmissed and unobserved End of chapter nine chapter ten of all along the river this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org all along the river by mary elizabeth braddon chapter x of the week my heart is weakest you had better send cards to mrs crowther isola said martin disney two days afterwards when his wife was sitting at her davenport writing her family letters cards oh martin she would think that so very formal i can call upon her she is always at home on thursday afternoons and she likes me to go i am sorry for that since i had rather you should never enter her house again martin i have nothing to say against mrs crowther my dear isola but the man is more detestable than i could have believed low birth and unlimited money could make any man guileless and inexperienced as you are i think you must have felt that his manner to you the other night was familiar to the point of being insulting isola had felt both embarrassed and distressed by her host's attentions the insinuating inflections of his fat pompous voice his air of being upon a confidential footing with her it had seemed to her on that evening as if for the first time in her life before the eyes of men and women she drank the cup of shame she had said no word to her husband of mr crowther's oppressive familiarity and she had fondly hoped that the matter had escaped his notice she sat before him now flushed and agitated with lowered eyelids and one hand restlessly moving about the papers on her blotting-pad my dearest there is nothing in all this to distress you said disney with infinite gentleness it is not your fault that the man is a cad but it would be my fault if i were to allow you or allegra to go to his house again he was not rude to allegra no it would be her turn next perhaps he did not mean to be rude to you he only wanted to be especially polite in his own odious fashion there are men in that class who cannot behave decently to a pretty woman or civilly to a plain one he meant no doubt to gratify you by his compliments what a stress he laid upon lostwithiel's attention to you at the ball 
were his attentions so very marked oh no not more to me than to others isola answered quickly he danced a good many times twice or three times with belinda crowther everybody noticed them as the handsomest couple in the room not that he is handsome of course only tall and distinguished looking allegra came running in from the garden and broke the thread of the conversation isla put the visiting cards into an envelope and addressed it to mrs van sittart crowther she felt that the kindly matron would be puzzled and vexed at this ceremony from a young person towards whom she had assumed so motherly a tone urging her to run over to glenaveril at any hour of the day asking her to lunch or to tea at least once a week wanting to take her for drives to lostwithiel or railway jaunts to plymouth isla was not mistaken for mrs crowther called three or four days afterwards and upbraided her for sending the cards you might have all come to tea on thursday if you had been good-natured she said mr colfox read us a poem by swinburne out of one of the new magazines there are so many nowadays that i never remember which is which belinda was delighted with it but alicia and i can't rise to her height mr colfox reads poetry beautifully you can't judge of his powers by only hearing him read the lessons added mrs crowther as if the english bible were a poor thing she stopped an hour praised isola's tea-making and the new cook's tea-cakes asked a great many questions about allegra's ideas and occupations and was as hearty and simple and friendly and natural as if she had been a duchess it grieved isola to be obliged to refuse an invitation to luncheon most cordially pressed upon her and allegra i would drive you both to lostwithiel after lunch and we could do our little bit of shopping and then have a cup of tea at the talbot while the horses had their mouths washed out and i'd show you the room where your brother's wife was so much admired last year miss leland and where i hope you'll have many a good dance next winter now the ice is broken we mean to go on with our balls i can tell you indeed my girls are thinking of trying to get up a tennis club ball about the end of september this was the last time mrs van sittar crowther appeared in a friendly manner at the angler's nest for after two or three further invitations to a picnic to tea to lunch had been declined in most gracious little notes from isola that good lady perceived that there was some kind of barrier to friendly intercourse between her and colonel disney's wife and she told herself with some touch of honest middle-class dignity that if martin disney was proud she could be proud too and that she would make no further offer of friendship which was undesired i suppose he thinks because he comes of a good old family while we have made our money in trade that we are not quite good enough to associate with his wife and sister she said to her daughters i thought he was too much of a gentleman to have such a petty feeling how innocent you are mother cried alicia contemptuously can't you see that they are all bursting with envy that was what made the colonel so gloomy and disagreeable that night of our little dinner he was vexed to see things done with as good taste as in a nobleman's house it cuts these poor gentilities to the quick to see that they don't much mind our being rich if we will only be vulgar and uneducated but when we have the impertinence to be as well up in the ways of good society as they are themselves they can't forgive us good taste in a parvenu is the unforgivable sin well i don't know mused mrs crowther sadly i'm sure there's neither pride nor envy in isola and miss leland looks a frank straightforward girl above all foolish nonsense so it must be the colonel's fault that they've cut us cut us echoed belinda the angler's nest cutting glenaveril is rather too absurd an idea my dear you don't know the importance 
cornish people attached to old family and the disneys are a very old family and no one can deny that he is a gentleman though we don't like him oh no doubt he considers that he belongs to the landed gentry he has bought rose farm two hundred and sixty acres he had forty to begin with so he's now lord of three hundred acres just half our home farm his cousin sir luke disney has a large estate near marazion said mrs crowther meekly yes but we don't reckon a man's importance by his cousin's estate colonel disney is only a squatter in this part of the country alicia pronounced the word with gusto it had been whispered to her that the squire of fowey had spoken of her father who counted his acres by thousands as a squatter that unimpeachable importance founded upon the established respectability of bygone centuries centuries in which men wore armour and women breakfasted on beef and ale was not to be bought with gold and silver and the want of it often made the miss crowthers angry diamonds they could have and land art and beauty even the ways and manners of good society but they could not buy themselves a history everybody knew that their splendours had all come out of a cloth mill that their ingots had been in some part transmuted from pestiferous woollen rags gathered in the jewish quarters of far-off cities ground into shoddy and anon issued to the world as sleek superfine cloth the more shoddy the higher interest upon capital and vansittart crowther's daughters knew too many of the secrets of the mills to be proud of the source of their prosperity mrs crowther was sorry to lose isola as a friend and protege her daughters were furious at the slight implied in this gradual dropping away they passed mrs disney and her sister-in-law with their noses in the air as they went from the church porch to their carriage they cut them ostentatiously if they met on the quiet country roads mrs crowther would still stop to speak and shake hands albeit she urged no further invitations and while the gulf widened between the great house and the small one the glorious cornish summer waned and slowly slowly melted away lingering very late in that fair western land which was full of flowers even when the home counties were being withered and blackened by the first frosts at last came winter and the gradual turn of the year short days slowly lengthening out by leisurely sunsets pale snowdrops glimmering in the borders and then the gold of crocuses and the bright blue of the siberian bellflower in patches of vivid colour and then hyacinths and tulips primroses on every bank narcissus and jonquil in every garden and by and by the full glory of bluebell and hawthorn blossom and anon in the middle of may came an event in which all the interests of colonel disney's life seemed to culminate in that balmy may time isola's first-born son came into the world and isola's young life hovered at the gate of death in so terrible an uncertainty that martin disney's hair grew grey while he awaited the issue of the contest between youth and weakness for more than a week after the birth of her baby isola's condition had satisfied the trained nurse and the kindly doctor she was very white and weak and she showed less interest in her baby than most young mothers a fact which mr bainham ascribed to over-education the young women of the present day aren't half such good mothers as those i used to attend when i began practice he said discontentedly their heads are stuffed with poetry and such like they're nervous and fanciful and the upshot of it all is that babies have to be wet nursed or brought up by hand if i had the government of a model state i wouldn't allow any married woman the run of a library until she had reared the last of her babies what does a young married woman want with book learning she ought to have enough to do to look after her husband and her nursery 
before the baby's son was a fortnight old fever supervened and isola's state gave poor mr baynham the keenest anxiety a hospital nurse was sent for to assist the established custodian and a great authority was brought over from plymouth to approve the village doctor's treatment and to make a trifling alteration in a prescription substituting bromide of sodium for bromide of potassium many days and nights of delirium followed the physician's visit a period in which the patient was watched at every hour of the day and night and one of the most constant watchers through all that dreary time was martin disney it was in vain that allegra and the nurses urged him to consider his own health he would consent only to leave the sick-room for briefest intervals of rest day after day night after night he sat in the same chair an old-fashioned armchair with projecting sides which almost hid him from the patient beside the bed he was never in the way of the nurse he was always helpful when a man's help was needed he was so quiet that it was impossible to object to his presence he sat there like a statue of patience no moan escaped his pallid lips no tear stole down his haggard cheek he sat and watched and waited for the issue which was to make him happy or desolate for ever all his future was involved in that issue he looked with a faint smile upon the pink little baby face when they brought his son to him no one would have dared to suggest that he should take care of himself and be comforted for that little one's sake they all knew that his first-born was as nothing to him all his hopes and all his fears were centred in the wife who lay upon yonder bed with glassy eyes and babbling lips a wanderer in a world full of torturing images fountains of bubbling water which she longed to drink great black serpents which came crawling in at the window and creeping nearer nearer to her bed wriggling hideous forms that hemmed her in on every side giant staircases that she was always trying to climb mammoth caves in which she lost herself fifty times bigger and more awful than those serpentine caverns near the lizard which she and allegra had explored in the previous autumn steeper stonier than the tall cliffs and pinnacled rocks above bud ruthen sands day after day night after night martin disney sat in his place and listened to those ravings of a mind distraught he could not keep himself from trying to follow her in that labyrinth of disconnected fancies visions of shapeless horror trouble confusion a wild babbling of numbers prattling of millions billions trillions as if her days of health and sense had been spent in the calculations of a rothschild she who could scarcely reckon the simplest account in a tradesman's book what had she to do with this torturing recital of thousands and millions this everlasting heaping up of figures then at another period of that long struggle between life and death reason and unreason she had a ghastly vision of two children squatting on each side of her bed one living the other dead a grisly child with throat cut from ear to ear again and again she implored them to take away those babies the dead child whose horrid aspect froze her blood the living child that grinned and made faces at her once and once only during that season of delirium the elder of her nurses carried the baby to her bedside the tiny form in snowy cambric and lace a little roseate face on which the first glimmer of intelligence was already dawning sweet blue eyes that smiled at the light rosebud lips that invited kisses the nurse took the infant to the side of the bed and asked the young mother to look at him those fever-bright eyes stared at the sweet small face with a gaze of ever-growing horror 
and then with a wild shriek isola clasped her hands before her eyes and drew herself cowering to the further side of the bed the dead child she cried why do you show me that dead child don't you see his throat streaming with blood it was a case in which the nurses had no easy duty by day or night and there were times when disney insisted that the night nurse should have extra rest while he kept guard but if she should be very bad sir you might not be able to manage oh yes i should my sister is a very light sleeper she would come to me in a moment and she has a great deal of influence with my wife this was true from the beginning of evil allegra's presence had exercised a soothing power she had been able to lull the patient to sleep sometimes when opiates had failed to produce even fitful slumber isola was calmer and less restless when her sister-in-law was by her side in those long night watches sometimes in solitude martin disney had ample leisure in which to ponder upon his wedded life and to consider how far the hopes with which he had entered upon that life had been realized the retrospect left him melancholy and with a latent sense of loss and disappointment and yet he told himself again and again that he did ill to be dissatisfied that providence had dealt kindly with him at five and forty years of age he martin disney of modest fortune and social status and of no especial claim to be admired intellectual or physical had won the hand of a lovely and interesting girl he had been so bewildered and overcome by the delight of his conquest that he had entered upon no laborious process of self-examination before he took to himself this fair and winning partner it had been enough for him that she came to him willingly lovingly in all truth and girlish simplicity loyal as she was pure he had never asked himself could such an attachment last on her side it had been enough for him that the love existed it would be his duty and his delight to strengthen the bond to draw that fair spirit into closer union with his own he had felt no shadow of fear for the future once having won her it must be easy to keep his treasure easy for him who would so faithfully guard and cherish this priceless gift of a benign providence he was a man of deep religious feeling a man who recognized in good and evil in joy and in sorrow the dealings of an almighty god with his short-sighted creatures he accepted his happiness in fear and trembling knowing the instability of all mortal joys but he had never feared the loss of isola's love yet now sitting in the deep of night beside that bed which might be the bed of death he told himself that his wife's love was lost to him had been lost from the hour of his return to trelasco when he went back to her with all the enthusiasm of a lover forgetful of his mature years of his long experience of life hard fighting hard knocks of all kinds in the great life battle he had gone back to her as leander to hero a boy in heart and hopefulness and what had he found in her a placid obedient wife gentle almost to apathy but with a strain of melancholy underlying all their relations which his devoted love could not conquer to all his interrogations her answer had been the same she was not unhappy she had everything in life that she desired there was nothing that he could give her no possible change in their existence which could add to her content all this should mean domestic peace a heart at ease yet all this was unsatisfying to martin disney for his instinct told him that his wife was not happy that the element of gladness was for some inscrutable reason banished from her life 
she had seemed happier or at least the little home had been brighter and gayer after allegra's coming but as the time wore on it became clear to him that the life and gaiety were all in allegra herself and that isola was spiritless and depressed it was as if the spring of her life had snapped suddenly and left her nerveless and joyless a submissive unhopeful creature that sense of disappointment and loss which he had dimly felt even when his home-coming had been a new thing had grown and deepened with the passage of time he had bought his land he had added to the space and comfort of his house he had enlarged the stables and bought a couple of hunters and a cob for harness and while these things had been doing the activity of his days the fuss and labour of arrangement and supervision had occupied his mind so pleasantly as to stifle those growing doubts for the time being but when all was done when the vine and the fig tree had been planted and he sat down to take his ease in their shade then he began to feel very keenly that his wife's part in all that he had done was the part of submission only she liked this or that because he liked it she was content and that was all and the line between contentment and resignation is so faint a demarcation that it seemed to him sometimes as if she were only resigned as if she suffered life rather than lived suffered life as holy women suffer some slow wasting disease in meek subjection to a mysterious decree he sat beside her bed while she battled with all the demons of delirium and he wondered whether when she had been at her best when her mind had been brightest and clearest she had been any nearer to him than she was now in her madness whether he had known any more of her inner self the mystery of her heart and conscience than he knew now while those wild eyes stared at him without sight or knowledge one summer morning as he sat alone in his watch in that dull interval between darkness and dawn the visions of the wandering mind took a more consecutive form than usual she fancied herself in a storm at sea the waves were rolling mountains high were bearing down upon her with threatenings of instant death she feared and yet she courted the danger in one minute she was recoiling from the wild rush of waters clinging distractedly to the brass rail at the head of her bed crouching against the wall as if to save herself from an advancing wave and in the next minute she sprang out of bed and rushed to the open window wanting to throw herself out of it disney was only just quick enough to seize her in his arms and carry her back to bed he held her there battling with him in a vehement effort to escape from his restraining arms why do you stop me she cried looking at him fiercely with her distracted eyes what else is there for me what other refuge what other hope let me go let me go cruel 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 let me throw myself into the sea don't you understand oh cruel cruel cold and wicked shameless and cruel there is nothing else only that refuge left let me hide myself in death let me hide hide her voice rose to a shriek and both the nurse and allegra came hurrying in the faint white dawn shone upon her livid face and on the scarlet spot upon each hollow cheek her eyes stared wildly starting from their sockets in that paroxysm of her madness only a few days after that night of terror isla was lying calm as a child the fever had gone down the enfeebled constitution had at last answered to the influence of medicine and gradually like the slow lifting of the darkness after a long night of cloud and fog consciousness and reason came back sleep soothed 
the strained and weary nerves and the exhausted frame which a few days before had seemed endowed with a superhuman strength lay like a log upon the bed of sickness recovery was slow but there was no relapse slow as the dawning of day to the tired watcher after the long blank night there came the dawn of maternal love the young mother began to take delight in her child and it was rapture to martin disney to see her sitting opposite him under the tulip tree in the low madeira chair with her baby in her lap allegra vied with her in her devotion to that overpraised infant while the shah and tim of the same opinion for the first time in their lives were almost rabid with jealousy they all lived in the garden in that happy summer season as they had done the year before when allegra first came among them it was in the garden they received their visitors and it was there that mr colfox came at least thrice a week upon the flimsiest pretexts of parish business to drink tea poured out for him by allegra's helpful hands while isola sat quietly by listening to their talk and watching every change in her child's face from smiles to frowns from slumber to waking allegra had taken kindly to parish work and in mr colfox's own phraseology was a tower of strength to him in his labours among the poor of trelasco she had started a series of mothers meetings in the winter afternoons and had read to the women and girls while they worked helping them a good deal with their work into the bargain she had done wonders at penny readings singing reciting drawing lightning caricatures of local celebrities with bits of coloured chalk on rough white paper her portrait of vansittart crowther had been applauded to the echo although it was not a flattering portrait she had visited the sick she had taught in the night school the curate had been enthusiastic in his appreciation of her and his praises had been listened to contemptuously by the two miss crowthers each of whom at different periods had taken up these good works only to drop them again after the briefest effort she will get tired as soon as we did said alicia when she finds out how impossible these creatures are unless she has an ulterior motive what ulterior motive should she have asked colfox bluntly who can tell she may want to get herself talked about as miss leland of the angler's nest a sort of useful companion to her brother's wife she is a nobody if she can get a reputation for piety and philanthropy that will be better than nothing or she may be only angling for a husband if you knew her as well as i do you would know that she is above all trivial and selfish motives and that she is good to these people because her heart has gone out to them ah but you see we don't know her her brother has chosen to hold himself aloof from glenaveril and i must say i am very glad he has taken that line for more than one reason if any of your reasons concern miss leland you are very much mistaken in underrating her you could not have had a more delightful companion said mr colfox with some warmth oh we all know that you have exalted her into a heroine a st john's wood st helena but she is a little too unconventional for my taste though i certainly would rather be intimate with her than with her sister-in-law surely you have no fault to find with that most gentle creature she is just a little too gentle for my taste replied alicia who usually took upon herself all expression of opinion while belinda fanned herself languidly in an aesthetic attitude feeling that her chief mission in this life was to sit still and look like la belle dame sans merci she is just as much too quiet as miss leland is too boisterous i have no liking for pensive young women who cast down their eyelids at the slightest provocation and are only animated when they are flirting the tongue is a little member quoted mr colfox taking up his hat and holding out his hand in adieu he was very unceremonious to these fair parishioners of his and talked to them as freely as if he had 
been an old french abbe in a country village it is needless to say that they valued his opinion so much the more because he was entirely unaffected by their wealth or their good looks they were naturally aggrieved at his marked admiration for miss leland those ripe months of harvest and vintage july august and september passed like a blissful dream for martin disney he had snatched his darling from the jaws of death he had her once more fair to look upon with sweet smiling mouth and pensive eyes and she was so tender and so loving to him in fond gratitude for his devotion during her illness so seemingly happy in their mutual love for their child that he forgot all those aching fears which had gnawed his heart while he sat by her pillow through the long anxious nights forgot that he had ever doubted her or remembered his doubts only to scorn himself as a morbid jealous fool could he doubt her who was candour and innocence personified could he think for an instant that all those sweet loving ways and looks of hers which beautified his commonplace existence were so much acting and that her heart was not his no true love has an unmistakable language and true love spoke to him in every word and tone of his wife's the child made so close a bond between them both lives were seemingly bound and entwined about this fragile life of isola's first-born mr baynham had no reason now to complain of his patient's want of the maternal instinct he had rather to restrain her in her devotion to the child he had to reprove her for her sleepless nights and morbid anxieties do you think your baby will grow any the faster or stronger for your lying awake half the night worrying yourself about him said the doctor with his cheery bluntness he has a capital nurse one of those excellent cow women who are specially created to rear other people's babies and he has a doctor who is not quite a fool about infant maladies read your novels mrs disney and keep up your good looks or else twenty years hence you will see your son blushing when he hears his mother mistaken for his grandmother after giving his patient this advice mr baynham told his wife in confidence that were anything to happen to the little one isola disney would go off her head i am afraid she is sadly hysterical replied mrs baynham i am very fond of her you know tom but i have never been able to understand her i can't make out a young woman who has a pretty house and an indulgent husband who never seems quite happy every woman can't have your genial disposition bell answered the doctor admiringly perpetual sunshine is the rarest thing in nature the early western harvest had been gathered in upland and valley in that undulating land were clothed with the tawny hue of the stubble here and there the plough horses were moving slowly along the red ridges on the steep hillside no touch of frost had dulled the rich hues of the autumnal flowers and the red carnations still glowed in every cottage garden while the pale pink trusses of hydrangea filled all the shrubberies with beauty a keener breath came up at eventide from the salt sea beyond point neptune and wilder winds crept across the inland valleys with the oncoming of night summer and the swallows were gone october a balmy season for the most part was at hand and there were no more tea drinkings and afternoon gossipings in the garden at the angler's nest the lamps were lighted before dinner the evenings were spent in the old library and the new drawing-room the new room communicating with the old one by a curtained archway so that of a night the curtains could be drawn back and martin disney could sit among his books by the fireplace in the library and yet be within conversational reach of isola and allegra in the drawing-room where they had piano and table easel work-baskets and occupations of all kinds 
mr colfox sometimes dropped in of an evening on parish business of course took a cup of coffee listened while allegra played one of mozart's sonatas or sang a song by gluck or haydn or handel mr colfox was not one of the advanced people who despised mozart or handel nor did he look down upon haydn indeed he sat and stroked his thin legs with a sheepish appreciation wrinkling up his loose trousers and showing a large amount of stocking while allegra sang my mother bids me bind my hair in her clear strong mezzo-soprano which was of infinite use to him in his choir he told everybody that martin disney's was an ideal household a home into which it was a privilege to be admitted i feel as if i never knew the beauty of domestic life till i knew the angler's nest he said one evening after dinner at glenaveril when he and the village doctor had accepted one of mr crowther's pressing invitations to what he called pot luck the pot luck of the man whose spirit burns within him at the thought of his hundred guinea cook and whose pride is most intolerable when it apes humility really now said mr crowther you surprise me for i have always fancied there was a screw loose there what does that expression imply mr crowther asked the curate coldly oh i don't know nothing specific only one's notion of an ideal home doesn't generally take the shape of a beautiful girl of twenty married to a man of forty-five the disparity is just twice as much as it ought to be upon my soul cried the curate i don't believe that wedded love is affected by any difference of years desdemona loved othello who was a man of mature age and black interrupted mr crowther with a coarse laugh well let us be thankful that colonel disney is not a nigger and that there is so much the less danger of a burst up at the angler's nest and now bainham with regard to this footpath across the wood who the deuce will be injured if i shut it up a good many people and the people i think you would least like to injure answered the doctor sturdily old people and feeble ailing people who find the walk to church quite far enough even with the help of that short cut short cut be hanged cried mr crowther helping himself to a bumper of port and passing on the decanter with hospitable emphasis it can't make a difference of a hundred yards it does make a difference of over a quarter of a mile and the proof is that everybody uses it and that it goes by the name of the church path i wouldn't try to stop it if i were you mr crowther you are a popular man in the parish for you well you have spent a heap of money in this place and you subscribe liberally to all our charities and what not but i don't mind telling you if you were to try and shut off that old footpath across your wood you'd be about the most unpopular man within a radius of ten miles don't talk about trying to shut it off man said mr crowther arrogantly if i choose to lock the gates to-morrow i shall do it and ask nobody's leave the wood is my wood and there's no clause in my title deeds as to any right of way through it and i don't see why i am to have my hazel bushes pulled about and my chestnut trees damaged by a pack of idle boys under the pretence of church going there's the queen's highway for em down em cried mr crowther growing more insolent as he gulped his fifth glass of sandemon if that ain't good enough let em go to the ranter's chapel at the other end of the village i thought you were a staunch conservative mr crowther and an upholder of church and state said mr colfox am i to believe my ears when i hear you advocating the ranter's chapel it's good enough for such rabble as that sir what does it matter where they go 
prosecute the boys for trespass if you like said the doctor though i doubt if you'll get a magistrate to impose more than a nominal fine for the offence of taking a handful of nuts in a wood that has been open ever since i began to walk and heaven knows how many years before but let the old gaffers and goodies creep to church by the shortest path that can take them there they'll have to travel by the queen's highway later when they go to the churchyard but then they'll be carried don't interfere with the privileges of the poor mr crowther no one ever did that yet and went scot-free there's always somebody to take up the cudgels for them i don't care a doit for anybody's cudgels bainham i shall have a look at my title deeds to-morrow and if there's no stipulation about the right of way you'll find the gates locked next sunday morning sunday morning came and the gates at each end of the old footpath were still open and nothing had come of mr crowther's threat the gates had stood open so long and were so old and rotten their lower timbers so embedded in the soft oozy soil so entangled and overgrown with foxglove and fern so encrusted with moss and lichen that it is doubtful if anybody could have closed them they seemed as much rooted in the ground as the great brown fir trunks which rose in rugged majesty beside them End of chapter ten